So today we have the uh, rest of the story from the book of Ruth. So we've basically read most of it uh, between yesterday and today. Just a quick recap for those who mightn't have heard yesterday's reading. So we have uh, Naomi, uh, who's in Bethlehem, so in Israel, and there's a famine there. So herself, her two sons, and her husband go to Moab. Moab was a foreign country. They were ancient enemies. So Israel and Moab <coughs> had previously had disagreements on things. Uh, so, <coughs> But there was no food in Israel, so they had to go somewhere. So they, they went to Moab. Okay, so there her two sons, Naomi's two sons, get married. Right, and after getting married then, uh, Naomi's husband dies and then her two sons die. So now she's left there in Moab with two uh, Moabite daughters-in-law. Daughter-in-laws. Daughters-in-law. And uh, so but she says, well, I have, nothing, I have nothing to live for here, so I'm going to go back to my people. And her, daughter, her daughters and obviously, they're, they're Moabites. So uh, to go back to Israel as a foreign widow wouldn't have been a great idea, as in there's like, there was no social welfare system, there's no way of supporting, how would you live, what would you do? So <clears throat> she says to them, look, you can stay here. I'm going to go back off home, up to Israel, back to Bethlehem. And Ruth says to her, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. I will follow you. And so she remains very, very faithful to Naomi, all, knowing that also for, even, even for, for a Jewish widow in, in, back in Israel, again, there's no family to take care of you. So it wouldn't have been an easy life. So she, Ruth, then, in this act of loyalty and devotion, stays with Naomi. And so they go back off <coughs> up to Israel. Okay, now while then, uh, while there, it was a, a tradition amongst the Jews that after harvest, when the men had gone through and cut all the, the grain and tied it into bundles and so on and so forth, that widows could go through the fields and pick up anything that had fallen to the ground. So any of the, any of the heads, any of the grains. Um, it's it's a, definitely a second rate kind of a job because you're going through the, the last pickings of what's there, but in, in a way to help them, and also it cleaned off the fields, I suppose. Uh, this was a, a, a standard tradition. So the gleaning, and gleaning is the word that we use in English for it. So, so Naomi says to Ruth, Ruth, go, go and glean the fields there to get something to eat. Okay, so Ruth's out there gleaning away, uh, picking up the, the, the fallen heads and the fallen grains and throwing it into her wee basket or shawl or whatever it was. And, um, and Boaz spots her. And oh, what I really really like about this is uh, when he sees her he asks who, who is this who is this this lady here and uh, he finds out what she did so he finds out that Ruth is a more Mo, Mo by Tess as we say she's from Moab and she came back as this kind of act of service and fidelity to Naomi so that she wouldn't be alone and it's just very interesting I find anyway that I have been told all that you have done for your mother-in-law since your husband's death and how you left your own father and mother and the land where you were born to come among a people whom you knew nothing about before you came here. Now, basically Boaz, Boaz kind of has his eye on her, we might say, in Ireland. Uh, he kind of likes her, I think. <clears throat> but... What I guess actually the next sentence is so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Now that this is a whole chapter skipped there. Um, the, it, goes, it goes from from Ruth chapter two to Ruth chapter four. So there's a whole chapter three missing there. Uh, that's so that it, it wasn't quite as straightforward like like the dancing halls back in the day where people danced twice and they will marry me sure. And next week it was bells and whistles in the local parish. Um, so anyway. He, he marries her, but he's attracted. What, what I find really interesting, and this is the point I wanted, I wanted to make today, is that he's actually attracted to her virtue. Right? He's attracted to her virtue. I have heard all that you have done for your mother-in-law. So he's, he's not just like, oh, she's pretty. I suppose I'll take you <laughs> as my wife. But it's more he sees that her, he's her, he sees her act of service. He sees her, her 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 generosity, her selflessness, and this risk that she took going to a foreign land. And again. You know, any, any, any countries where there's kind of tension, political tension between them, if you then go to that country and you're way outnumbered, and they could tell maybe by your accent or by your skin color or whatever it was that you're not from here. So, like, to, to, oh, you're from Moab. 
Ah, my great grandfather died in a battle against the Moabites. You know what I mean? This kind of thing. You know, it would have been, mightn't have been particularly pleasant to be in a foreign country that you had been at war with. So she takes, it, she takes this risk, and Boaz, Boaz sees her virtue and is attracted to her virtue. I, I read through it just to be sure this morning, uh, and I don't, I don't remember reading anywhere in, in the book that it says that Ruth was pretty. Now, I guess we imagine that she was pretty, but it doesn't actually say so. <laughs> so again, what, what, what it, he seems to actually be attracted to her virtue. Now, this is actually really, a really interesting thing, because when it comes to fashion and when it comes to young people and teenagers and attraction and all these kind of things, there's, there's this kind of almost a danger in thinking that that beauty, that beauty is almost sinful. Or, and you even hear this amongst younger people, especially younger ladies today, where uh, I, I can't use the exact words they use because it's not exactly appropriate for a homily, but, but, but that when a person creates, there we go, when a person creates, if a woman creates lust in a man, then you're pretty, right? I think you know what the expression is, all right? Okay, uh, maybe you don't. Doesn't matter. Good, stay pure and innocent. Um, so the, the basically the, the more lust you you the, the more guys look at you and desire you, the prettier you are. Now that's very very dangerous because I think then there's a danger then that we misunderstand what beauty is, right? That beauty then becomes almost beauty equals temptation. Beauty equals temptation, or beauty equals you know desire to lust after. That's not it. That's not it at all. Like when you think about beauty, think about like God is beautiful. There are these things called the, the transcendentals, the, the, the qualities of God. So one one is that he's he's one. One is that he's truth. And the other is that he's he's beautiful. So God Himself is beautiful. You look at the creation, things that He makes, everything from people to the universe to a bug. Most of which are kind of pretty, uh, to like leaves and snowflakes. I mean, there's beauty and order, and and these are all reflections of God. He creates them. They're they're beautiful. And even within us, when you see a child, it's interesting. Like that, the reaction beauty creates in us. When you see a child, they go, "Oh, look at the little baby!" And you change your voice for something. Why do we do that, right? And then, generally speaking, we also want to touch what we find beautiful. Oh, you look little putty cheeks in it. Oh, you getting that little Buddha? Who's a little Buddha? You know, and, you know. And we we do these things. Or like when you see something you like, oh, that car is amazing, and you just want to kind of just kick the tire or, or just touch it. You see something beautiful, you want to touch it. It's just it's an, kind of a you see. Well, I suppose kids and cakes is kind of different. Oh, it's a beautiful cake. <laughs> That's kind of different. You just want to eat it. Uh, actually, people say that about children as well. You know, oh, you're so beautiful, I just want to eat you. I have never said that in my entire life. I find that concept just completely foreign and strange. But anyway, to each his own. Um, point B. Beauty attracts us. Okay? And in, in many, many things, like when it comes to, you know, you might have a beautiful sister, you might have a beautiful child, you might have a beautiful whatever it is. It's not bad. It's not sinful. It's not wrong. And even this desire then to, to say, touch the beautiful things again, in and of itself isn't a bad or isn't a beautiful, isn't a bad thing. But, but, beauty isn't there to tempt us. Beauty is an invitation to love. Beauty is an invitation to love. In God's mind, beauty should be <clears throat> an invitation to love. So, even for, for single men, when they see a beautiful woman, this shouldn't be, uh, oh my goodness, you know, big temptation and fantasies of all strange and awful things, but more, I, I think I like her. Um, I might ask her out. Do you know, it's, a, it's an invitation to kind of, it's an invitation to love. It, it's not an invitation to lust, but our, our world has confused that. We're now, we're now, as I say, beauty equals lust or beauty equals temptation, and it, it's not. It's not. It's not. That, that's a complete perversion of, of what beauty should be. Beauty is an invitation to love. So what Boaz sees in Ruth is, is virtue that makes him desire her. And it's going to be interesting, like in heaven, I, mean, I think in heaven we, we do receive a glorified body, so it'll probably be 
a little different to the one I have now, I suppose. A um, little more buff, slightly more tanned, not so prone to sunburn. Um, but, but, but I think what, what we'll actually find attractive about each other in heaven is actually the person's virtue. Virtue, like that they, and, and, and this is the case also here. It should be the case also here. I think it sometimes is as well. It should be. No, actually, I'm sorry, I correct myself. It should be the case here that we find virtue attractive. It's actually not always the case. When you think of the pornographic mentality that, that, that has crept in, the girl's name actually makes zero difference. The girl's lineage, family, where she's from, how many languages she can speak, where she studied, makes absolutely no difference at all. Uh, whereas these kind of things should, who the person is, how they are. And that way, we should, when we see like a person who's, who's loving and serving and joyful and forgiving, that should make them more attractive. It's virtue. Virtue makes them more attractive. When, men, when women see, see a man who's selfless and serving and, and courageous and, and stands up for his family or his little sister, and then that, that, that virtue should be attractive. It's not, it goes beyond the physical, you see. It goes beyond just physical, what I like, I like what I see, but I like that, the heart of that person. So beauty, beauty is much more than, than skin deep. As, such, as human beings, we, we need the beauty on the outside to get our attention in the first place. Uh, but real beauty is much, much more than that. Much, much more than cosmetics. The beauty that our hearts long for is actually virtue. This is what Boaz saw. This is what he was attracted to. This is why he married Ruth. And it's such a, a, a wonderful lesson for all of us today. That beauty is not a desire to lust. Beauty, sorry, beauty isn't a, a, an opportunity to lust. Beauty should be an invitation to love. So whenever we see something beautiful, it's, it's not sinful to see something beautiful. It is sinful to lust after it, but it should be an invitation to love. And then a deeper understanding of beauty is the heart, the virtue, the interior life of the person, not, not just what you see on the surface. So we've... we've our, our modern culture has a lot, to, a lot to learn, really, about what real beauty is and how to appreciate it and how to react to it and what to strive for. But we ask the good Lord today, through the prayers and intercession of our Blessed Lady and Saint Joseph, to renew the minds and hearts, especially of young people, but also maybe of, of married couples, to recognize what true beauty is, not just what we see on the surface, but the virtue of a person's heart. Amen.